college. Oh. He uh, helped me and encouraged me to become a professor at Galvin College. He um, encouraged me to run for office um, when I didn't want to because my stammer was so bad. Um, but he's someone that I'm going to miss terribly. He's someone that meant a lot, not, not only to me, but uh, throughout this community, most recently serving um, and working with Gordon Machado, um, Scott Fuller, Chris Breen, working to um, bring a walkable um, element to our developments that move forward in this county. And so I, I know he's someone that uh, really wanted to see that Dow Webb project because he wanted to be the first person to move out there. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's certainly someone that um, we're all going to miss. And so my condolences are with his family, with his wife, Kathy, and um, you know their extended family. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Rivas. Uh, Supervisor Munzer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to express my regrets that we lost... Um, Larry Pellin, who was our um, interim RMA director, and he was very instrumental in writing that ship before we got John on board. He was acting as the lead engineer. He was mentoring the other engineers in that department. He had been with us for a little over a year, and and he was... I know we worked together on trying to resolve the CSA issues, and he was just really instrumental in in, in getting RMA department on the right track. And we're going to miss him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, if we can stand for the pledge, uh, led by Supervisor Rivas, and remain standing for a moment of silence. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Can I have a... A motion for a certificate of posting. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, hearing none. Um, do we have any presentations or recognitions today? Looks like it's a quiet day on that front. Uh, we'll move on to public comment. Do we have any? Marty Richmond from uh, Hollister. I'm, I'm going to stay away from the microphone. I uh, hope you'll forgive me, and I hope you'll give me just a, an extra s few seconds to say I am I am saddened by both those losses, but especially by the loss of Mr. Ruiz. Uh, you know, Mr. Ruiz and I worked together uh, on the Gavilan College issues, and and you all know this to be true. He fought like hell to get what he thought we deserved. He set the example for what I think a public service person should do. He was not satisfied with the answers that said, well, too bad, that's all you get. He, 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 he was man enough to stand up, and when he knew he, he was being bulldozed, he resigned. And he did that because he refused to be party to those factors who would say, San Benito County, you're not worth anything, and we're not going to do anything for you. I am really saddened by his loss. I did not know he was uh, ill if he was. And uh, so I hope, uh, I hope his uh, family and his friends will take those condolences to mind. Now on to my uh, item. Look, I'm up for a fight, and I'm always willing to fight, but I want to fight fair. You have three, quote, fact sheets in one of your issue items. Uh, Mr. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that. No, this has nothing to do with the issue. This has to do with the sheets. The sheets are not marked properly. Two of them are not marked in accordance with the federal, with the, with the uh, um, 
campaign laws. The, uh, uh, one of them has the marking on who paid for it. Two of them do not. Those are required by the FPPC, Fair Political, or FFPC, Fair Political Practices Committee of the state of California. It has nothing to do with the issue. If you look at them, at least on the internet, two of them are missing the required marking on who paid for those sheets. Now you guys know, because you're campaigners, that that marking has to be there. One of the sheets has it, two other documents do not. Now if you want to play, fine, play fair. Put the marking on there on who paid for those documents. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Anybody else would like to address the Board of Supervisors uh, on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to Department Head Announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we have a few announcements this morning. Uh, the first announcement is, um, as you see on the walls, we have put up the calendars for 2018. February the uh, 15th, you'll notice that there's a board retreat scheduled. So I want to remind the board that uh, we'll be meeting at 9 a.m. next Thursday, February the 15th, uh, to um, discuss the future, kind of what we're going to do this year, kind of brainstorm and, and you know, kind of a town hall meeting where we can kind of uh, put our thoughts together and our, on our accomplishments quickly over last year and what our goals are for the next year. Um, the location will be at San Juan Oaks uh, at 9 o'clock and we'll be meeting in the larger room right next to the Freddie Couples room. So I want to make sure that uh, everyone's aware of that. What date was that, Ms. Chao? Next Thursday, February uh, the 15th. Uh, with regards to that, we, um, if you'll notice the calendar, the next six months or approximately five months actually now, um, we have um, uh, multiple meetings. It's not just a normal two board meetings in dark green. We have a light green, and those are our special board meetings that we have had since I've been on board as a CAO and interim CAO uh, to discuss budget. And so we're going to be discussing that. We'll be discussing the state's budget, where, where they're at um, in the legislative process and, and kind of the funneling of money and what we're going to be receiving, as well as um, many other aspects of the budget, so the roads and, and other key components to this year's budget that uh, we want to look at and address. So we'll be discussing those items. So hopefully you can mark your calendars and, and be ready for those meetings. Um, with that being said, I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, Louis Valdez up, our management analyst. He has a quick update. Mike. Mike, microphone. Online. Should have remembered that. It's the former clerk. Sorry about that. <laughs> you got mine. <laughs> got mine. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Uh, the CAO and uh, per the board direction from uh, the last time that we brought the issue to the board uh, has uh, asked uh, us to prepare a presentation for the board retreat that will speak to the issue of possibly pursuing a general sales tax. Um, in reviewing that item and in beginning to conduct the analysis of it, we're going to provide you with a pretty general ever overview of how that process should work. But uh, at a larger, on a larger scale, uh, it also is going to speak to revenues. And that will include the general sales tax discussion. We'll also discuss the uh, uh, parameters of what a fee schedule may encompass with regard to the cannabis ordinance if something like that is passed. The TUT tax uh, is something that I know has been uh, discussed by the board. Um, there is also the issue of the business license that has some history behind it, and I know that the board has been interested in that. Um, and there is also the question of uh, the, the extraction fee for quarries. We're going to cover those in a very general uh, way at the uh, retreat, and then depending upon what the board directs us to do, we'll prepare a series of uh, analytical memos. I've uh, begun to work with our budget director now that we are in budget season uh, to begin working on what those projections may look like um, and then presenting that to you uh, as the board directs. So we wanted to make you aware of that. Um, uh, that will take place next Thursday uh, during the board retreat. If you have anything that you'd like for us to cover in addition to that, certainly uh, please direct that through the CAO. Thank you. Thank you, Louie. Um, 
I'd like to invite John up. I know this is just a quick item. I'd like for him just to, to discuss real quickly um, the CSAs and kind of where we stand with regards to hiring and so forth. Thanks, John. He is our RMA director as well. Morning, supervisors. Morning. Um, so we had interviews. Supervisor Munzer helped out with the interview panel uh, last week. So we hope to have a CSA coordinator in in the next few weeks. Um, as you know, the CSAs are an area where we've uh, failed in terms of uh, management in the past, and so that's where we're going to be putting efforts in. Uh, we're going to create kind of a team approach, and it's not just going to be the CSA coordinator on their own. Uh, the finance team is, is being trained on how to, how to uh, facilitate uh, the management of the, uh, the finances for the CSAs so that we can get information out to the community and educate the community on how CSAs function, uh, what the funding sources are, where the money's housed, what it can be used for, and how we're using it. Uh, so that we can develop work plans going into the future so that the community, uh, the communities in the CSAs know on any given fiscal year what the work is that's going to be done in their CSA so there's no more confusion about what it is that we do. And they can hold us accountable for getting that work done. So uh, hopefully in the next few months you'll start to see a market improvement in how we're managing the CSAs. Um. Any questions, uh, uh, Supervisor Medina? Yes, I'm the, I'm the CS, CSA coordinator at the current time it's a half-time position right uh, no it's a full-time position now right now it's a full-time position right and how is that paid is that paid through the CSAs himself it is and it was always been a full-time position for uh, no that is not correct it's been a half-time position and I know we've been working on trying to bring up this individual on as a full-time position okay so as they go on to a full-time the CSAs will take on that expense also so it'll be a full-time position paid by the CSAs they will but they'll get improved services as yes no exactly I want to make sure yeah it's going to be much better services so right. it's going to be well worth the right. uh, so they're actually the extra getting more dollars. for their buck yeah. yeah and they'll be able at if we had a full-time person they'll be able to contact us for full-time person and ask for the balances and anything else that's related to those particular CSAs yes right. and, and in a timely manner yeah thank you very much I appreciate it uh, thank you, Supervisor Medina. Anybody else? <coughs> I know, uh, I, I hope this new person comes on and is successful in in making it a little bit more transparent as far as the, the funds uh, that are available in each of the CSAs. It's a big job, big job. And, uh, and also the scheduling of, of what work that needs to be done on an annual basis, and, and hopefully we get that, uh, you know, done in a timely manner you know our years are different but you know i i know we've all had what who has csas uh, have had that that issue right along and and this board has you know in the past have made a real good faith effort to resolve these issues but it's you know the execution has been lacking and ho hopefully we'll uh be a little bit better going forward now which i have a lot of faith we will be Right. Thank that's, you. That's the team approach. Is that's why we're having finance help because in the past I think we focused on the financial aspect of it, and now we're focusing on the customer service, project management aspect, so we can get projects done. <laughs> Great. Thank yeah. you. Th right okay. on, John. Thank you, Th John. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, the last item that I have is um, I just want to make sure the board is aware that um, we plan to have a special board meeting, um, a joint uh, uh, two cities and county uh, meeting concerning fire in the near future. So we're going to review the new uh, report that we'll be receiving soon. I just want to make sure that the board, we don't know that date yet. We'll make sure the board's informed of that. But want to make sure that, you know, keep that on your radar in the next month or two. Yeah, hopefully it'll be in early March. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to board announcements. Uh, Supervisor Medina? None. Okay, Supervisor De La Cruz? Uh, none, Mr. Chair. Uh, Supervisor Rivas? Announcements? Yeah, you know, I have, um, I was encouraged to go out there, the Highway 25, Look at. I know that we had had a discussion last year about this issue with ZBest and that intersection there, um, and so I was encouraged by some local residents to sit out there and look at the mess, and it's pretty messy. And so I was hoping, Mr. Uh, CAO, if we can agendize 
an update about the situation there. I know it involves, it's not on our, you know, unfortunately it's not on our county uh, or it's not in our county, but certainly our county is bearing 100% of the impacts of the mess out there. And so if, I'm not sure if we can get some some folks from Santa Clara County to come down and give us an update as far as how we work to mitigate some of those transportation issues out there but it is it is dire it is a problem yeah. and so certainly if we don't speak up as a county board as to far you know as 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 far as the issues out there um we need to know you know if if, if anything at all can be done about the situation there because it is pretty it's 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 bad out there thank you mr chair okay thank you supervisor months oh uh john go ahead so my understanding is that our planning folks are working uh, with them right now to understand the permitting of that and uh, and the process that that's going through so we can come back soon with a report on that for you. Great. Yeah. Great. That'd be great. Okay. Very good. Supervisor Munzer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and <clears throat> being very careful not to go too far on a single subject, but Supervisor Dela Cruz and I will be meeting as part of the Mobility Partnership Committee tomorrow, and that has been brought up to that committee and that's dealing with the county of santa clara and the vta so okay and that's all i have uh thank you uh, and uh supervisor de la cruz and i attended a uh, uh, a special meeting of cog on saturday afternoon uh, just to you know meet with the public as far as the uh, potential of a of a sales tax for our roads a special tax for um, maintenance and congestion congestion relief and uh, so we're still gathering uh, information we're going to continue to have special meetings i believe um although the next one's not announced yet but uh but anyhow it was successful i i thought uh, yep. and and we have to have more of them and i encourage uh folks that when uh, we're in the process of a survey uh telephone survey please answer the survey and uh, uh share the information that we need to move forward thank you now we'll move on to a consent uh, any of the supervisors have any items to pull seeing none motion to approve consent oh uh, let me ask the public oh. uh, does the public have any items to pull off of the consent uh Su supervisor de la cruz i'll entertain the motion so move Okay. <laughs> I have a second. Second. Uh, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. We'll move on to our regular agenda. CEO uh, Espinosa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, regular agenda. We have item number 14, our Health and Human Services Department. We have Jim Riding Sword, our Health and Human Services Director, here to give you um, a, brief up, a brief update on uh, public. <coughs> <coughs> Good morning. Uh, if you've been watching the news, uh, almost every day the top of the news is something about flu. Um, hospitals are crowded. Um, I, I heard over the weekend there's now three strains of flu out there. And so uh, we've been asked to do an update on um, what's going on about flu in San Benito County. And I'd like to invite Kevin Ahern and, and Mary White up to the podium to do that for us. Thank you. <clears throat> well, this is not the right one. Got the wrong one there. There it is. Got it. Thank you. Didn't want to spoil anybody's fun there. <laughs> Steal anybody's thunder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, for allowing Public Health Services to give you an update on influenza in San Benito County. My name is Kevin Ahern, and I'm a public health nurse and immunization coordinator at Public Health. My colleague, Mary White, is a pharmacist with our emergency preparedness and communicable disease programs. We've both been involved in public health's flu monitoring, prevention, and containment efforts. As you know, the 2017-18 influenza season has been a more active and severe flu season than in recent years. There has been much concern, and we would like to take this time to provide you with an update on our current status regarding flu and our community. Here is some historical perspective on flu, which has significance for this year's flu season. 
2018 commemorates the 100th anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic. The 1918 flu pandemic was the most severe flu pandemic in recent history, although there have been others in 1957, 1968, and in 2009, and there will be more in the future. It is estimated that about 500 million people, or one-third of the world's population at that time, became infected with influenza during the 1918 pandemic. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with about 675,000 in the United States. Mortality was highest in people younger than five years old, 20 to 40 years old, and 65 years of age and older, most of whom were otherwise healthy. This reflects some of the same groups we see significantly affected in the current 2017-18 flu season. The Centers for Disease Control uses this historical perspective to leverage the lessons of the past to prepare for today's influenza challenges. Good morning and thank you, board. Understanding influenza's seasonal pattern and how viruses work, let me switch slides here. Okay. Um, public Health starts implementing prevention strategies long before flu season begins every year. The challenge with influenza is that from year to year, we don't know when exactly flu season will begin or how severe it will be. Flu season can begin as early as September and stretch into May. This unpredictability is due to the nature of the flu virus and community immunity status. In the spring, we began planning our annual fall community flu vaccine clinic and community and healthcare provider messaging, among other strategies. Based on information from the Centers for Disease Control, the California Department of Public Health, and the World Health Organization, it was predicted that this year's flu season could be early and severe, and in fact, that is what we've seen. Public Health decided to conduct our annual community flu vaccination clinic earlier than in past seasons, as soon as we could be assured of having adequate vaccine supply from the state. Therefore, we were able to hold the clinic a month earlier, in October rather than in November. Planning and executing the countywide flu clinic is a major endeavor. It involves setting up a mass immunization clinic offsite, working with our local community college to enlist student nurses, recruiting volunteer registered nurses and other personnel, obtaining and transporting vaccine in a temperature controlled manner, and much, much more. We conducted the clinic on October 26th, where we vaccinated 595 people in a five hour period. On December 27th, during the holiday closure, public health staff were notified by a local skilled nursing facility of several flu cases. We quickly recognized that this was a flu outbreak. Our public health team responded immediately. We began a communicable disease investigation and worked with our Hazel Hawkins Hospital, skilled nursing facility, and pharmacy partners. We ensured appropriate and timely antiviral treatment and prophylaxis to over 100 patients within a 24-hour period. Concurrently, our local emergency room and hospital were reporting a higher than usual number of patients with influenza, reflecting what was happening throughout the state. Unfortunately, in the last month, we received notice of two San Benito County resident deaths due to influenza. So all of this illustrates the danger and seriousness that the flu presents. During the outbreak and hospital emergency room surges, public health also fielded numerous media calls, provided press releases through various media outlets, our webpage, and social media, our health officer, Dr. Newell, even provided an on-camera interview with KSBW. We participated in all California Department of Public Health emergency flu teleconferences, and we continue to do so. Public Health also sent out numerous health advisories and updates to our healthcare providers and to the public with recommendations on how to protect against the flu. And we did this through Benito Link, the freelance, local schools, websites, social media, et cetera. So in response to increased community awareness and a need to prevent further influenza infection in our community, public health instituted walk-in flu clinics four days a week 
on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. These clinics will continue until vaccine supplies are exhausted. Public Health has also held several mini flu clinics for persons experiencing homelessness, both in the field and at the new shelter. Public Health tracks and monitors disease trends on a regular basis so we can respond to communicable disease outbreaks and direct resources quickly, as quickly and efficiently as possible. We are able to track and monitor local disease trends by partnering with Hazel Hawkins Memorial Hospital Laboratory, their, their emergency room, and our local pharmacies with whom we have built strong relationships. We continue to monitor influenza closely using these resources. We learned in our most recent teleconference with the California Department of Public Health that adequate vaccine and antiviral supplies remain available throughout the state at this time. While there are hints that flu season may have peaked, state epidemiologists warn that the numbers of reported flu cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are still higher than usual, and they cannot predict when flu activity will subside. The state recommends that we continue all prevention efforts, including vaccination and timely antiviral treatment. We encourage all residents to get their flu shots. It's not too late. Flu vaccinations are available through your health care providers and pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Public Health provides free flu vaccination to all individuals six months of age and older at 439 4th Street, just down, around the, just down the street here, on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from 8.30 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but only while supplies last. We would like to thank the board for this opportunity to update them on public health efforts to prevent influenza disease in our community. And we're happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a huge issue in our community, as state, and, and nation, as a matter of fact. And I really appreciate what public health department has, has done to try to alleviate some of the you know, outbreaks that are in our own county and in the continued work. Is there any questions from the board? Uh, any questions from the public on this issue? But uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jim? Yes. Um, so um, one of the things I hear as I go around the community is, well, I got my flu shot and then I got the flu. And, um, <clears throat> and one of the things I think that people need to understand, at least from my perspective, kind of being a layperson, is because you get the flu shot, because there's three strains out there right now, doesn't necessarily protect you against the flu, but it does, according to Dr. Newell, decrease the impact that it has on you if you haven't done it. So if there's anybody in the audience today who hasn't gotten their flu shot, including the Board of Supervisors, <laughs> Yeah, Public I, health is a half a block away, and they're taking <laughs> walk-ins today. Oh, they will take they will take members of this audience. <laughs> okay, there you go. Five minute break. Um, and I know, and I know we're busy because because this is I mean this is what happened with me. I would go in and talk with them. And they would say, Jim, do you have your flu shot? And I said, well, I haven't gotten it yet, you know, and I've got other things to do. And da -da. Until, you know, one day they were pretty insistent that I sit down and get it. Um, and, and so, you know, we had uh, a few uh, weeks ago on a Friday, we had 40 walk-ins. Forty people walked in to get their flu shot. So um, I really encourage, you know, everybody, you know, to to get that done until we run out of the vaccine, which, you know, I think we have a pretty good supply. Yeah. And then... I um, have a question, Joan. Yes. Uh, can you get the flu twice? Uh, according to what I heard on um, the news this weekend, the answer is yes. Okay? Uh, because they're different strains. Okay? There's A and B and C and D and or whatever they are. Um, so if you have A... And you get a vaccine, or if you get a vaccine for A, uh, and then you, you could get B. But according to everything I hear, you know, the impact of that illness on you will be diminished because of the fact that you've tried to protect yourself uh, from this. Uh, I remember the 1969 flu for myself uh, laying in my apartment for a week hoping that I 
would either get well or die. And uh, <coughs> it was. And since then, I've been pretty faithful about getting flu shots. Um, could you talk a little bit about w what deaths we report and how they're done to the state? Sure. So, flu is so. There are certain communicable diseases that are required by by law to be reported to local um, health departments. Flu. For example, like tuberculosis and syphilis and these obvious diseases, flu is only reportable under three conditions, I believe. A novel flu strain, one that, in other words, one that we haven't seen before, deaths over oh, between the ages of zero and 65 years, and then I see in intensive care unit admissions. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Yeah. So that's that. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure. uh, I'll open it up to the public. Uh, uh, can you could step to the microphone, please? <laughs> this is great. Questions from the press. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just want to ask, getting the shots, is there a cost? It is free. Free. And why are not deaths over 65 reported? There's a lot of us dying, and I just kind of like to wonder why people over 65 are not counted. I do not know why the statute, why the regulations. Okay. Uh, we can, thank, thank you, Mr. Chapman. Well, <laughs> no, I think th that's a parameter set by the state for reporting disease, and I think one of the rationales behind that is because under 65, um, it is less likely that there were underlying conditions um, that may have contributed to the death of that person. Not that over 65 is not um, important for us to know and keep record of, which we do <clears throat> locally, um, but under 65 has other implications. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Are there any records of people who got the flu shot and still died? Because we're keeping track of the ones who didn't get it and died. Um, I was wondering how many. Yeah, it the other part of the story are the anti-flu shot people, which right. will be in my story. But I was just kind of wondering: is anybody tracking? Okay. How many got the shot? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a uh, another public comment. He had, he had the flu. <clears throat> ay, ay, ay. Uh, I've had the personal experience, unfortunately, of, uh, of the flu. So um, I did actually ask the exact same question of the Mercury News because I had a big article about people over 65 who died from the flu. And according to them, their editors, that criteria for reporting is actually established by the federal government, the CDC, not the state. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's accurate. I'm just telling you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the public? If not, I'll close the public comment. Um, any any other? last thoughts, uh, Mr. Writing Sergeant? Uh, get your flu shot. Okay. Uh, today. Good, good advice. Hey, thank you. Okay, thank you. That's an informational item. We're going to move on to our next item on the regular agenda and before we go there uh, to, on the introduction from the CAO uh, just to clarify uh, a public comment earlier in uh, the meeting um, and I think it was in re regards to this item is that you know we're playing fair we're all in you know being politicians we're we all like a good fair fight level playing field but and uh, some of our information uh, that's in our packet uh, is from people that are supporting SB1, and it is uh, noted that where the funding comes from and is reported to the FPPC, uh, and it's clearly uh, marked in our packet and and in, on the information that. Uh, uh, staff and myself has, have submitted for this uh, item. So uh, last week, uh, last meeting, Supervisor De La Cruz, reporting f from I guess CSAC, brought forward this item, and we wanted to get a little bit more information before we took an action on a letter of support for opposition to the repeal. 
And so with that, uh, CAO Espinosa, I'll let you lead into it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's absolutely correct. On January 23rd at your board meeting, your board um, requested staff uh, to look into uh, the data and understand um, concerns from the public with regards to SB1 and either um, uh, staying with uh, or moving forward with uh, support for CSAC or, or not moving forward. So with that being said, we did, uh, staff did meet on uh, Monday, February the 29th uh, with CSAC staff, Kiana Valentine, she is a senior legislative analyst uh, to discuss um, the matter at hand and to uh, address, uh, you know, kind of uh, just have a better understanding what your board had asked us to do. Um, so I do have Mary, uh, we have um, Mary Gilbert, she's our COG director. I've asked her to come up here and speak a few words. Uh, prior to that, I'd, I'd like to, she, you can go up, Mary. I'd like to state that I did receive a, um, an email um, from uh, CSAC with regards to the ballot measure initiatives and kind of where we're at in the line of time for this year. Um, with that being said, there are some qualified state wide ballot measures, uh, and this I'll only talk about the ones that pertain to this particular item because it's relevant for the uh, topic itself. Um, is Proposition 69. Not sure if all of you are familiar with that. That's SB1 revenue protection summary. This measure would extend the existing constitutional protections and ensure fuel tax revenues are spent on transportation to the approximate 30% of revenues generated by SB1 that aren't currently protected. Current status to CSAC Board of Directors in this regard to CSAC, CSAC Board of Directors took action as at, it, at its January 2018 meeting to support this measure. Uh, consistent with CSAC's proposition on ACA A5. Um, again, that is a qualified uh, statewide ballot measure. Proposed initiatives undergoing signature collection is really the one that we're here today to discuss, and that's the SB1 repeal. Again, this measure would require the legislature uh, to secure a two-thirds vote in both the Senate and the Assembly, then obtain the majority vote of the electorate to enact any gas, diesel, vehicle-related vehicle tax or fee increase. Since the initiative has a retroactive date of January 1st, 2017, it would repeal SB 1. So current status. Proponents reporting have collected 25% of the required signatures as of December 15th. Uh, they may, they have until May 21st to collect the remaining 75%. So there's still an, uh, definite ways uh, to go with that. I just want to make sure the board was aware of the status and kind of where we're at in a line of time. So uh, I've asked uh, Mary to go ahead and give a quick update. Mary, thank you. Sure, yes, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, I just put together um, some uh, information on the new gas tax and SB1 estimates for San Benito County, so just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of um, the direct funding through SB1 coming to the county. Um, so I want to just walk you through this just so everyone um, understands that there are there's many different fund sources that are coming through SB1, and I have a slide at the very end that shows um, kind of where everything's going, but um, specifically the um, Road Maintenance and Rehabilitation Account, RMRA, um, are, are funds that are coming directly to you in addition to the gas taxes um, that you've already been receiving through the highway user tax. Um, so the estimates, the new estimates for fiscal year 2000. 2017-18 are up on the slide here. Um, the first source is an SB1 loan repayment. So um, part of what SB1 does is it guarantees for three years that funds that were taken from transportation and uh, used on for the general fund, loaned to the general fund, are going to be paid back. Um, so um, every jurisdiction is getting a payback amount uh, from that loan repayment. So your new estimate um, is $118,000 approximately. Um, and I'm saying new estimate because um, when SB1 was first passed back in April, we were working with some other estimates. So the numbers have actually gone up a little bit um, for 1718, um, and that's based on you know actual revenues that are being collected that we're seeing. So um, 
the road rate repair and uh, rehabilitation account, um, you're estimated to get 594,000, almost 595,000 for 1718. So that's new funding that can be used for local street and road repair and rehabilitation. Um, that's the funding that does require a maintenance of effort. Um, so any general fund monies that San Benito County was using um, for road, uh, the road fund, road repairs, um, you need to maintain that level of effort. And I know that you're, um, uh, you've been working on that, um, and you have some specific projects identified for those funds. So total new money through SB1 just for 1718 is $713,000. Um, you, you will still continue to get um, what I'm calling up here your regular highway user tax. So other highway user tax funds of $1.8 million. So for a total of $2.5 million in um, uh, road maintenance and rehabilitation type of funding. And so then I've also included the estimates for fiscal year 2018-19. So again, we have the same fund sources. Your loan repayment is about the same, um, but you're seeing more in the RMRA account, $1.7 million. So a total of $1.8 million of new funding, um, thanks to SB1. Um, and then $2.1 million of your highway user tax. Um, and the reason that the 18-19 estimates are higher is because um, some of the SB1 programs won't be in full effect for the 17-18 fiscal year, um, they'll go into effect more fully in 18-19 than even further in 19-20. Um, and so this, uh, this flow chart was put together by the California um, Association of Councils of Governments, of which San Benito Cog is a member, um, and it shows all the SB1 transportation account flows, and you have the handout that has this on the back of it as well. Um, but just to show you that, so in addition to those RMRA funds that are coming through and the loan repayments that you're getting directly, um, kind of in that green bubble that's up there for the 12 cent gas excise tax, um, the other taxes and fees are going to several other programs that are being implemented statewide and um, will be implemented locally in San Benito County as well. Um, there are some funds that are um, competitive funds, so you have to put in a grant application for projects. Um, so we're monitoring oh, those. And, uh, one second, yeah. Mary. Uh, Supervisor sure. Rivas? Yeah. Um, in, I had written down a question, and you mm -hmm. just touched on okay. it. It says... Um, in the spring of 2018, the the CTC and the California uh, State Transportation Agency will announce grants for competitive programs. Yes. So that if we qualify, maybe you can give me a couple examples of some projects that could qualify for that. Sure. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you can. I've, no, yeah. Um, that's great. But that would be, say we qualify, we get um, the monies. That would be in addition to what, um, in addition to the totals you just went over, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so any, any competitive, uh, competitively funded projects would be, would be additional dollars that are coming through. Um, for the first round of SB1 funds, um, I would say that the highest um, priority project um, that is benefiting from SB1 is the State Route 156 Improvement Project, which is scheduled for construction in 2019. Um, so we are using our state um, highway dollars um, for that project, and SB1 brought some stability back to the state highway funding program, which is called the STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Program. So um, we're able to um, ask the California Transportation Commission to make sure that they fund that in 2019, and it's, it's pretty much a guarantee that, that we'll get that funding, you know, uh, pending their action. Um, but there are those other competitive programs. Um, the um, City of Hollister is looking at getting, uh, has put in an application for some funding for a project on Gateway Drive and San Felipe Road. Um, for a roundabout project, and um, the San, Santa Clara County, which is uh, effect, or important to us, as you mentioned earlier today, um, is looking at getting funding for the Highway 25-101 um, interchange um, through a competitive program. So, you know, um, this first round of competitive applications was really focused on um, shovel-ready projects, and so those, you know, those projects um, have a good chance of being funded. The more shovel-ready they are. Anthony. Um, Anthony. And so I think, yeah, I think that is a good, well, a good way to um, summarize One those. second, we yeah. have another question. Okay. I, I don't know if this is the right time to ask, but uh, I know you were talking about some numbers earlier. In 2017-18, the additional revenues would be 613000 and in 18-19, 1.8 million. What, um, um, that's what we receive. 
What do we actually put in? Uh, oh, okay, so you're asking how much uh, gas tax dollars do, does Roughly. San Bernardino County spend? So I'm going to ask Melinda to come up and actually speak to what oh. we received and kind of Perfect. what we're doing. Yeah. We can do that so, later. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for me? Okay. okay. Uh, you continue. Um, I think actually that um, uh, Supervisor Rivas's question kind of helped me um, finalize my comments there, just that there are okay. you know, several different competitive <laughs> programs, um, and those are ways that uh, more money is coming into the county. Um, I, we are getting state transit assistance money also that's coming, um, that's paying for some operations of the um, County Express and Hovind San Antonio um, uh, transit services that are provided in San Benito County as well. Great, thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, may I add just one, one more Jail. comment to this? So um, in the meeting, one of my um, questions was the methodology. How, how, you know, how, how do they divvy it up throughout the state of California? And the cities uh, receive transportation funding and uh, through a per capita base. The counties used to receive it uh, completely as per capita. but. A couple decades ago, um, I think it was Proposition 22, if I recall, locked in a 75-25 split. And the reasoning for that is for obvious reasons. Our county has a lot of rural roads. And there's a lot of, you know, how, how are we going to be able to address these uh, huge amount of miles in the, in the rural counties compared to um, larger uh, cities and counties, for instance, or really counties where there's a lot of um, per capita there. So that's, that's why they came up with the split. The split was really to help the, the rural counties uh, a few decades ago. So we receive basically 75% uh, is uh, revenues through registered vehicles and 25% is through maintained miles for less population. So that's how they came up with this formula. It's in statute. It's, it's we can't, it's it's a, it's in it's in place, um, and it's constitutionally uh, protected. So that's that's the methodology used. I want to make sure the board was aware. I think that was a, a question that came up at our last. Yeah, meeting. that's real yeah. helpful. Does that uh, help you, Supervisor <coughs> Medina? You have any further questions? Well, right. Supervisor De La Cruz. Uh, thank you. So Ray, even if we were to take a contingency of say half of San Benito County up to Sacramento, there's nothing we can do. Well. Again, you know, there's, and I'm going to invite Louie up to talk about um, donor counties and, and a few other things. But again, you know, when we look back in history, Prop 13 was really kind of the essence of how things kind of started. And then a lot of other uh, infusions of funding to the state or th uh, to the counties, um, kind of through impact fees and many, many other ways, kind of came about, was really kind of born from that. So it's very difficult to change um, a Prop 13, or in some cases, the constitutionally protected items like the one that we have here on, on the split, the 75-25. So it's, it's protected. Um, very, very difficult to change. Um, I don't know, Mary, if you want to add anything further with that. I mean, that's what uh, was stated, so. Yeah. Anthony. <clears throat> Anthony. Oh, Supervisor Medina, just, um, just so I'm clear, you know, you mentioned Prop 13. So basically, the way I look at this is for every dollar in property tax that someone uh, pays, we receive about 13 cents to the dollar for the general fund, uh, roughly 13 cents. Right, yeah. So you were telling me for every dollar we're going to receive in this additional gas tax, we're going to we're going to receive 75 cents? N no, it's it's 75 percent of the revenue is at, on the percentage, whatever that whole percentage is, and I, you know, is going to be through registered vehicles. That's what that is for. So we don't know. Do we know anywhere? What I'm asking is, if I have a paying twelve cents extra, what do I receive in return? What, what do you receive in is return? Is it a penny? Is it two pennies? Is it? Mary, can you answer that? It's no. It's. I mean, it's a fair question, and I um, I understand the concern that. Uh, um, you know, that money is going, you know, we're paying money at the pump, and uh, how much of that are we getting back? And Louie hopefully has um, maybe some information for you, but I will just note that, you know, I was in Sacramento last week, I was Supervisor Botello, and we asked that question directly of um, a, a group of folks, and it's a really tough question to answer, essentially, is, is the answer that we got. How is it? And maybe well, that doesn't sound good enough. What I don't understand so, is I can look at the property tax and yeah. say for every dollar we receive 13 cents. 
you're telling me that there's something going on up there that I can't say for every dollar I spend in taxes, I'm not going to receive, I don't know? Well, oh, what's going on? Uh, yeah, no, I mean... No, it, it's, I, I think... Uh, let, was, uh, let me try to help clarify that question uh, for you, Supervisor Medina. We're get back uh, X amount of dollars to for local street maintenance uh, roads uh, locally, what we're paying at, at the pump. But we have a state transportation system that needs to be maintained throughout the entire state. Uh, different... Uh, assets you have rail you have uh, state highways you have you know just a number of things just look what's been spent here in San Diego County in the last few years here uh, you have um, highway 25 safety improvements yeah what's that the was 10.8 million dollars is of eight million dollars and that doesn't include the uh, barrier uh, but and that was another 10 million yes we have 10 million going on, whether we agree with it or not, down in uh, South County with uh, some curve uh, straightening. Uh, we have a $80 million project that uh, gets started next year, right. the 156. Um, and, and then we drive, I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I, I go all over the state and uh, <laughs> on state highways in some very rural areas you know should, shouldn't we pay a portion of that we have 25 uh, I mean 50 percent of our uh, public that lives in San Diego County driving up to Santa Clara on state highways and federal highways and and uh, I you know it, it, it's it's going to be spent elsewhere because we don't just drive our cars here we use different modes of transportation and uh, so an argument could be made that, you know, we're paying for a whole system. And there's not enough revenue generated locally that is uh, help us with a number of our projects. We have one one point eight billion dollars or. Uh, I don't think we're spending that much on on uh, gas taxes. Right. And yeah, I don't think yeah. San Diego County is generating that. And much. so that's the logic I look at. I don't like paying taxes either. You know, there's. I, I don't like the idea that I uh, only get 13 cents out of uh, the property tax, but you pay. You're paying for a school system to educate the public, which is for the overall good. Yeah, well, uh, that's the way I'm looking at this. Well, well, once again, you're still avoiding the question. I'm just asking, what do we receive in return? I mean, I'd like to know if I'm spending well, something, what I, I receive mean, in return. I mean, I, I guess if you look at it from the global perspective, we're receiving what she said. It's the 700 and something thousand dollars. That's what we're receiving out of the property yeah. tax. It's 71 thousand seven hundred pennies <laughs> so it what, is but it's it's you know it's, what do we put in that's well, what that's I'm, yeah. yeah that's that's what i'm wondering because right. if we put in 10 times that amount right then maybe we should do our own measure well louis here to talk about that i've i've missioned him to discuss this portion of the conversation so louis if you may some chairman members of the board um the question i believe supervisor medina that you're asking and please correct me if i'm wrong how much money in gas taxes are paid locally by city and county residents to the state of California, and in return, how much does San Benito County get? Yes, sir. All right. So the answer is not so simple, but I'm going to try and address it as follows, okay? Um, specifically, we will have to go back and get a number for you because I don't know what that answer is, okay? <laughs> Presumably, and I may be wrong, but it all depends on the type of allocations that are um, specified in state law. Presumably, we're going to get we're going to get a smaller amount back, perhaps, than what we actually send up. However, that is true not just of sales taxes, but of property taxes of all different types of taxes. And I think uh, the chairman hit the nail on the head. Uh, the largest portion of taxes that the state has are property taxes. And the largest allocation of those taxes that go back to local jurisdictions, that's where they're allocated, are to schools, K through 14. It's called ERAF. So that's a big portion of where those pro so property taxes go. So when you ask of the 13 cents that the county gets, uh, that the county pays, how much do we get back? Well, 
got to pay the schools, got to pay the special districts. Eventually, this county of San Benito ends up with uh, an allocation of that. How much that is, I do not know yes. at this point, but I can come back and at the at the retreat, I can give you a report fine. on that. That's fine. But the, uh, from a larger perspective, um, when you start talking about this particular issue, um, and this is something that uh, was alluded to before, are we a donor county? I think a donor county, a, a stronger argument can be made, if you will, by not us, but like Los Angeles County. They have billions of dollars that they donate. Naturally, they have a different amount of money that they get back because their tax base is higher, their tax rate is higher. So is San Francisco's, which is a city and county. So is Alameda and so on and so forth. So the answer would depend. But what we can do is without getting too far afield of uh, what the details may be, we can go back and do the research. We can uh, speak to um, the state and we can come back and give you some specific information uh, along those lines. Perfect. But are we a donor county? I don't know that we can say that we are a donor county. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, as well, add one more. Uh, I was going to say, oh, yes, when I was up. So when we look at this as well, I mean, how many gas stations do we have in our county? In the unincorporated area? Uh, zero. Z yeah, so um, <laughs> if we really looked at it from that way and analyzed it, how much money we're receiving, we may have one in Tres Pino, so i got to double-check that. But um, still, one. the amount of tax coming from that one station, I'm not sure if it's going to be. But we need to look into that and answer that question. Well, well, well but, but when you look at that, you said it perfectly, but the city of Hollister, as I understand, mm -hmm. they have the largest tax revenue for them is service stations. Yeah. So when I look at my constituents, yeah. Yeah. they are in the city and they are spending their money in the city. So when you're talking about, yes, how many do we have in the county, I'm looking at it as my constituents. Um, Jaime's, they're all in the city, I believe. Three. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. so you look at that, I understand what you're no, saying. Yeah. And there was a gas station in Church Pinos because yeah. I just filled up yeah, there a couple yeah, weeks ago. Yeah, in Church Pinos, I know. I, used, <laughs> okay. I, used little, I know that well, one. Well, yeah. why but, don't we bring this meeting in? <laughs> I, I, let's gather all the information in the presentation, <laughs> and then we'll go to public comment, and then we could kind of debate Fair the enough. issue. Fair right. enough. Fair um, enough. I'd like to invite next uh, Melinda Casillas, if you can get up and just give a quick... Um, just a quick update on these numbers um, of the um, the one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars. We have not received any money um, uh, for the loan repayment. We are anticipating that our next um, payment, which should be at the end of February, uh, we should. CSAC is anticipating that we would get some a portion of that loan repayment um, of the five hundred and ninety four thousand dollars January 31st was the first payment that they made against that and we received around seventeen thousand five hundred dollars they are anticipating CSAC is anticipating that that will be roughly five times more than what we received um, in January. And then of the $1.8 million, which is up about 120, 30,000 than we originally anticipated, um, we are right now, as of January 31st, we are at 52% of that. So we have received 52% of that $1.8 million so far. Uh, just to give you a quick update on what we've actually received so far this year. Okay, thank you. I'm just sure one last thing, uh, and I think you and I uh, discussed this, uh, the self-help county issue. Um, we're not a self-help county. Um, to become a self-help county would require a 66 and two-thirds percent vote of the people to approve that. If we were eligible uh, to, uh, or if we were a self-help county, and I think uh, Supervisor Rivas has alluded to this before, then we would be eligible for an additional pot of money through SB1, which right now we are not. So I just wanted to make the board Anthony? aware. I think Mr. Medina has. Is that the two hundred million? I believe. Yes. Okay. That's Great. Okay. Thank you. Good point. All right. That concludes the presentation. Uh, we'll go on to uh, public comment. Marty Here's
here's the guy who doesn't understand transportation funding. You saw that picture. Does anybody understand transportation funding? So let's let's cover it once and, once and for all. First of all, I didn't ask you to repeal SB one. Excuse me for not talking to Mike. That I don't want to infect. Him. I didn't I didn't ask you to repeal SB one. I I asked you to go get us a better deal. Maybe for once you guys ought to listen to what I say. Why why should I bother come up here? Okay, I asked you to go to the, to the state and get us a better deal. And why do we need a better deal? Well, let's look at the loan repayment. The state took the transportation money loan and put it in the general fund, and now they're asking us to repay that loan with a tax, and they're going to give us the money back. In other words, they're giving us our money back. And to answer uh, Supervisor Medina's question is, we're going to get less than one-third of what we put in. Everybody knows that. Come on, guys, you know that. You know the percentages. We're going to, for local roads, we're going to get less than one-third of what we put in. Everybody else has already dipped into the pot. Who's paying the $500 million to put in a train system in the valley? We are. It's funny. I find it funny to hear the, 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 the chair say, well, we only get 13 cents on the dollar. That, we're educating everybody. You never say that when the property tax comes up. Never. You always say we're only getting 13 cents on the dollar and we should get more. Well, we should get more of this. This is designed to help those counties that have mass transportation, that are generating the more money. It is not designed for counties like ours. We're not getting a fair deal. That's the problem. Excuse my loud voice. All I asked you to do was to write people a letter and get up there and say, we want a deal like everybody else. If you're paying off the cities in Riverside County to get their vote, which you are, read the Sacramento Bee for SB1, why not come down here and pay us off too? Who the hell are we? Are we your poor relations? Come on, guys. Go get us a fair shake on this money. Less than 33 cents on the dollar is not a fair shake on for, for a for a county that has half their people commuting yes they're paying gas tax here yes they're paying gas tax everywhere yes they use all the roads but people use our roads come on 156 runs through this county 156 is an inter-regional highway aren't people using the road uh, through this county don't we get hit with the don't we get hit with the air pollution problems from 156 don't we isn't that a problem for us? Everybody knows it is. That's all I asked you to do. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else from the public would like to comment? Seeing none, I'll, okay. I'll bring it back to the board for further discussion or ask for information or a motion. Um, before we go there, I, you know, last week, uh, two weeks ago now, you know, I, I did go up to Sacramento, and and one of the things that um, you know the group that I was with was the Central Coast Coalition. You know, the counties from Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Monterey, and Santa Cruz, and we got to meet with some you know very uh, powerful transportation hitters. Um, you know, we met with uh, Brian Kelly and his successor. He's uh, with the rail authority now, uh, but he was a key architect of uh, SB1 and got that through. It was four years of, of work, really, uh, to get this legislation. And also we had lunch with uh, uh, Susan uh, Branson, uh, CTC uh, executive director. She's been with the state uh, just a, a knowledge of uh, with transportation and you know one of the things 33% uh, of this is going to local roads uh, for for maintenance but there, the other portion of it is going there's other counties that ha uh, have a priority with rail or congestion relief uh, the state has to get their their fair share of this too, um, and we're getting. I, I think we're getting our fair share. You know, all things uh, you know being equal, it's better than what we 
had before. If this disappears, uh, Ms. Branson said, if this disappears, there's not a, be another project in California uh, as far as highway projects. It, it's a, all a be, it's a just evaporate. Two years ago, if you recall, the stip was cut $750 million. It was devastating to the cities, to the uh, rural California, and that's what we would be looking at if SB1 goes away. I mean, it will be catastrophic. Forget about 156. Forget about Highway 25. Uh, uh, you know, just, you know, it's over. We don't need to go out for a sales tax, trust me, because with our pittance of a sales tax that we're considering, it's not going to do anything for, uh, uh, for congestion. We have a chance with this, and CSAC, which Supervisor De La Cruz brought this issue uh, from his meetings, asked us to take a position on opposing SB1 repeal and supporting the letter, and also supporting uh, Prop 69, which safeguards th these transportation monies into transportation. And. Um, you know, I, I, I think I feel very strongly about this. I've been uh, lobbying with this uh, uh, group of local leaders in Sacramento for a number of years, and we finally got this over the finish line. Supervisor De La Cruz. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I got a comment and then, uh, I'm sorry, I got a question and a comment. Um, Ray, my understanding the the Opposition to SB1 did not get enough signatures for a June election. Is that correct? Um, as of now, they do not have enough um, signatures. That is correct. They do have, though, however, to – let me see here. Let me get the exact date on this. They do have till um, May 21st to collect the 75 percent that, that's remaining. So still, For the June uh, election. For the June election, that's correct. I will, Louis. Uh, I'm sorry to uh, interject. Uh, Mary Gilbert indicated that um, the signatures are due by May for the November election. Oh, it's for the November election. No. So it's not a June election now. No. Apparently not. Okay. Apologies. Uh, I apologize. I, given the fact that there's a window of opportunity here, I I think what we should do, and this is only one supervisor, and I'm the one who brought it up for endorsed to support the, re the opposition to SB1. And that's the reason why I ask, you know, would it make a difference if we send a contingency of San Benito County residents up to Sacramento? Would it make a difference? I think Marty's right. I'll give him, I'll give him that. I think we should send a, a delegation to, to Sacramento for the time being. It says we're not happy with the formula. Uh, we're not happy the way it's what we're getting, but we want a bigger piece of the pie. And, and Sacramento says no. They said no, but at least they heard our voices. At least they heard us that we're not happy with it. And I think we have an, a window of opportunity to do that. And at the end of the day, we'll, par we'll probably be playing bluff with Sacramento, but at least they, they, they hear us that we're not happy with it. Okay. And I'm, I'll make a motion that we include an amendment before to I, the... Yeah, before I take any motion, so let's finish our discussion at the board, and then I'll entertain a motion. Sure. Thank you. Yes, fair. Uh, Supervisor Rivas? Yeah, you know, there's really... Um not much more than I, uh, you know, that that I could add, you know, as far as the previous comments, as far as sending a delegation. I mean, obviously there has to be a game plan, right? I mean, we have to, you know, if when we look at this legislation, I think you know the concerns that were expressed are extremely valid, you know, and that um, is why, as a board moving forward, that you know we have to express our local concerns through staff, as board members, through an advocate in Sacramento. Uh, because we certainly have a long way to go as a small rural county to fight for our fair share, right? I think the SB1 certainly is you – know, there's no perfect legislation. And, 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 you know, that statement goes – you know, you know it's, it's probably, you know, more meaningful now than it has been in previous years. You know, this is uh, a challenging um, a political environment in Washington and in Sacramento. Um, but, you know, it's, it's hard to not see that sign when you drive on Highway 25 into town – uh, what is it? It's like, uh, you know, uh, the Democrats, you know, let's get rid of this, you know, repeal the Democrats' gas increase. So is this a California problem? So I did some research. And so when SB1 was passed through the legislature, the Road Repair and Accountability Act, 
I was curious what other <laughs> states have done. So since the passage of SB1, four other states have passed funding plans dedicated to improving transportation. Indiana, Montana, Tennessee, and South Carolina. This here, what we're dealing with in, as SB1, is roads crisis, it's not a state, it's not a California problem, this is a national trend. And um, states are acting because the federal government is not acting. And so, you know, states are, are, are acting to improve neighborhood streets, state highways, bridges, public transit systems through the investment of transportation taxes and user fees. And so um, I was able to get this data uh, online, but since 2013, 26 states with a combined population of 170, of 170 million Americans have passed fuel taxes, vehicle fees, or other transportation-related fees to fix roads and bridges. Of these 26 states, 17 of them are governed by Republicans. I think that's significant because this isn't a Democrat problem. This isn't a Republican problem. The solution we're dealing with SB1 is a national problem. We're all, all of us are impacted. And this is our collective responsibility as elected officials, whether you're Democrats, Republicans, in trying to solve this problem. Um, you know, so clearly you have states here that are acting because the federal government has not touched the federal that gas tax in nearly 25 years. Nearly 25 years the federal government has not failed to increase the federal gas tax. The Federal Highway Fund Trust is nearly insolvent, estimated to be $20 billion in the hole by 2020. So in the meantime, as we're facing in San Benito, as communities are facing throughout our state, roads, bridges, transit systems around the country are aging, uh, falling into poorer condition, and increasingly falling short of modern uh, the design standards. And so as Mary was saying uh, earlier, the eligibility of additional funds through, through competitive grants, uh, I would encourage people to visit, it's called rebuildingca.ca.gov. Uh, to look at the list of projects that are slated, you know, that are shovel ready throughout the entire state. They have our county in there, uh, our region in there, what projects are being slated to be funding. Actually, San Benito County, the list that we approved is on there already as well. Um, look at the major uh, corridor improvements to major intersections in the state, and you'll see that um, certainly, as the chairman was saying, that this is kind of our collective, you know, problem. And, in, in, you know, I, I know you had mentioned um, meeting with uh, former Secretary Brian Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with him when he talked about um, something Ronald Reagan said um, when he signed the federal legislation in 1983 to raise the national gas tax. He said this, Reagan said this, when we first built our highways, we paid for them with a gas tax, a highway user fee that charged those of us who benefited most from the system, that benefited most from the system, it was a fair concept then, and it is today. And I think the same could be applied today, you know. Um, and so I agree with former President Reagan. And, um, I, you know, I support SB1. Certainly, I think the concerns that have been discussed, especially by, by Mr. Richmond, are extremely valid. And that's why I think we have to be more diligent in going to Sacramento and um, expressing our local concerns as a rural county, done through RCRC probably is, you know, the best avenue to do so. But we need to continue to fight for our fair share. You know, we need to continue to advocate that, you know, and that's why I think that, you know, it's going to take a collective effort here in San Benito, working with city council, working with COG to really emphasize planning and to, you know, uh, be able to prioritize projects that are shovel ready in the years to come. So it's challenging, easier said than done, but it's certainly a goal that, um, you know, we can establish for ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Rivas. I, uh, the night before the meetings that we had, uh, uh, Ms. Gilbert and myself met with Ms. Stone and, and talked about transportation and, and, you know, what we need to focus on in Sacramento. And that would be a continued presence that we're going to have, you know, 15 minutes of or 30 minutes of our time, you know, once every quarter or whatever, we get to meet our legislators or, you know, folks like um, the Secretary of Transportation or, you know, the uh, CTC Executive Director doesn't, you know, that's not a lot of time to get a lot done. But having that presence, that lobbyist up there, it was it is a step in the right direction, I believe. And she's going to be at our uh, retreat as well next week. Uh, any other supervisors' comments? 
uh, Supervisor Medina and then Munzer. Good. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Um, thank you. So I want I would like clarification. Has the uh, opposition to SB1 have they failed to qualify for the June ballot? And are they looking towards the November ballot? As, as I mentioned before, no. The answer would be no. They still are in the process, as, as the uh, letter states from CSAC, um, are still undergoing signatures. They're 25 percent of the 100 percent that that's required. They have 75 percent more to go, at my understanding, by mm, May 21st. That's what I have here. Again, I just received this letter this morning. <laughs> okay. So, well, you know, I guess my feeling I, is I, I've read this this morning, gone over it a few times. Uh, so they still, they're, 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 <laughs> it still may sh show up on the June ballot. I, you know, I can't answer that. I will not answer that because I'm not 100 percent sure. But I will tell you that what I've read this morning is that they're still undergoing signatures. As I mentioned at our last meeting. They didn't. They did not have the signatures required, and there is no resolution on this meeting or before because there is not an initiative yet established. When that happens, then we probably will be coming back with either a resolution of some other okay. some other so legislative actually, portion. There, of that. there is no action in. It's just. It, it's just to this support. Item, it's just, this is just information. At no, this no, time? it's no, to support. It's to support CSAC and the. And there, there, okay, there is an action. Okay, it's just a, to, okay, to so support through a letter. Through a letter, right. correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a letter. So, <laughs> this can There's a possibility of this showing up on the June ballot. It's still out there. I'm. I'm seeing. I'm seeing. No. So it's <laughs> not going to show up on the. June My ballot. understanding from what Mary just told me was that they are trying to get on the November ballot. Now, if there was or is or may have been an effort to get on the June ballot. I don't know about it, and I don't know that but, Mary ever knew Mr. about Chair, it. Mr. So. Chair, May. So in here, this is qualified statewide ballot measures June or November. So it's vague. June or November. Or November. And okay. I, it goes through the list. This, I, this list also extends to the uh, proposed initiatives undergoing signature collection. So it may be June. It, 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 it may really not. It's too late. It, it, it doesn't. It's going to be in 2018 if they re, if they right. get their 75 percent. Yeah. The remaining 75 percent. The proposal is for 2018. So, in whatever time frame that's I going to be, I'm whether June or figure, I just try to figure out November. If we, have, if we need to act today, one way or the other, or if we have some time to to continue getting more information I, on this. Having said that, I, I concur with Supervisor Revis. No, no bill is ever perfect. This, this is an attempt, just like the attempt at um, fixing our health care needs a few years ago, um, was an attempt that was greatly criticized. This is an attempt at repairing or, or repairing the funding mechanism. To, to sustain our roads and our infrastructure. And it is not perfect, but at least it, it's an attempt that, that has been made for the first time on at the state for 20 years or so. So um, I, I, I concur that we do need to do our homework and try to lobby for a better deal, whether we can get it or not. I think working through CSAC and RCRC and any other effort is is the way to go. We have been doing that, um, but I'm ready to support this letter today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Mendita. Yes, first, uh, it's state of California. It seems like tax, 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 tax. That's what uh, is happening here. You know, I look at it a little bit differently. You know, you, when you're in the private sector. You can only charge so much for your good. Sooner or later, your customers, they'll look at a substitute product. Now, the correlation here is with taxes. You keep on increasing taxes, sooner or later, some of our residents will leave to a different uh, state. Now, what I'm seeing here is when I started a year, little bit over a year ago, I was amazed about this prop, the Proposition 13 on the 13 cents. You know, 13 cents to the dollar. And where did all the other money go? And 
everybody's telling me, well, it's wrong. You know, we, we, were, we were ripped off for this and that. So I look at that, and I wasn't around when that happened. I don't know when that was, in the 70s? It was 70. 75. So I was uh, six years old. So now I have a chance to make something, to talk about something that's formulating at this point in time. They're taking taxes from us, and they're only we're only receiving, as one person said, 33 cents to the dollar. So what I also look at is we do need infrastructure. We do need to fix our roads. But then I look at the bullet train. The bullet train, the last estimate I received is $64.2 billion. Just out of coincidence, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mary, you might know this, over the next 10 years, this uh, tax will bring in about $52.4 billion. So rather than create a new infrastructure, which is a bullet train, maybe we should look at fixing something that's deteriorating and that is falling apart prior to building something new. That's all I'm looking at. It's we're not using our money wisely. Instead of uh, cutting back and looking what should be done correctly, we're just saying we'll tax the residents and uh, ignore some of the other things that are happening within our government. So I would not, uh, and I would, I, I sit here saying we need more time. We need to send someone, send people. I think we have a consultant on uh, staff. Maybe she can go to Sacramento and see what we can do there. But w we need to sit down and really think about if it's 33 cents on the dollar, how do we rural city, r rural counties receive more of that, uh, that pie? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Medina. Um, any other comments? Supervisor Dema Cruz? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if, um, I'm not going to ask a motion for right now, but I'm going to ask that if we can add some language to the current letter, or better yet, delay it to the next meeting. I hate to say it, hate to do that, but I think it's important. That we heard from the from the members of the public that we're just getting you know lower and lower, lower dollars of our portion c coming to San Diego County, and it's it's about time that it's a structure that's almost you know unbreakable to break. And I think that you know if we continue to nib at it a little by little, eventually it'll start to hear us. Um, and I think it needs to start today with this language, and I think we need to put some type of language that says that with deep reservations, we'll support this due to the fact that we don't get our share, our, our portion, our portions of, of the SB1, and we will continue to take a delegation to Sacramento to continue for them to hear our opposition. Other than that, I won't be able to support this letter. Okay, thank you, Supervisor Dale Cruz. Hey, you know, one of the things that concerns me is CSAC, an organization that we belong to is kind of heading up this um, effort and you know I know I, I'm a, the representative on RCRC and you know, I, I would hope that we would be very supportive of issues uh, pertaining to that group and and this was uh, SB1 was really hard fought by CSAC and and early leadership and early education of the public uh, for the need of this uh, is, you know, how you head off a disaster. You know, we were taught, uh, Supervisor Medina brought up, you know, the fact about the bullet train. I agree with him. I think that's the most ludicrous idea um, that anybody could dream up. Well, the fact of the matter is this. The California voters voted for that damn thing. It, that's the problem. Jerry Brown, as uh, much as it's connected uh, to him, but the voters voted for it, for it. We, you know, and I would love to see that re be reconsidered, but um, and spent on our roads. But that's probably not a happen. Uh, and I, I certainly feel that. Um, this is just a letter uh, putting us in a certain camp. Um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that we're not getting our fair share because I, I think that could be uh, um, looked at in different ways. You know, it, like 
I mentioned a few projects al already that were in the works, and that doesn't include the Santa Clara County projects. You know, we also, being part of that coalition, got $10 million to do a feasibility study for a realignment of 152 to fix Highway 25. Uh, you know, all of this ties together. But, you know, if the board wants to wait again for, you know, for more information, I don't know what, but uh, it, it, that'll be up to the board. I'm, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair? Yeah, and so as has been discussed, I mean, so the request for the letter came from CSAC, correct? That's correct. And so, you know, and so the, you know, the comment I made to the chair earlier was usually when we, when we have actually qualified ballot initiatives, we'll review them and write a letter. Why they want something so early, I don't know. You know, I mean, it doesn't change my position on SB. Certainly, you know, this thing, if, 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 if it does qualify for a ballot initiative, you know, it's incumbent on the public and voters to educate themselves and to, you know, do our resources. And so that's why, I mean, for, for I mean, you know, the challenge of this discussion is it's so early, you know, uh, and so I don't know. I mean, I would I have no problem with the direction that my colleagues want to take this. I have no problem approving a letter, at, you know. But I think the longer we wait, the more information we can gather will allow us to address more concerns later on. Or you know, you know, it, I would rather see the ballot initiative and the language and all that before doing such, you know making such an action and then we can approve a letter and then because this is really historically this isn't the way we do it so okay Thanks, thank Mr. you sure. uh supervisor medina just to clarify something um supervisor Rivas, you were saying that usually stuff like this doesn't happen until after it's well, printed and the ballots are uh, well i mean for our board if we ever take a position on a ballot initiative i mean the, uh, a good example was proposition 64 i believe was that the marijuana one the recreational use one and um, they had request. I think we made a decision as a board to formally up, up support that proposition. Three members of the board, but we made that decision two weeks before the election. Okay, so you know, and so usually it's you know we wait until we see what's qualified for the ballot, and then if if um, CSAC or our state um, uh, are you know the associations we're affiliated with, if they have a recommendation from their board of what we should do, then. Our representatives will bring it back and saying, "Hey, do we want to take action on it?" Thank so that's you. why this is a little, you know, extraordinary. I guess. You could say. Thank you, uh, Supervisor De La Cruz. Yes, <clears throat> and I remember those discussions at the CSAC level. And in fact, I even asked that question: "Is why are we bringing this to early?" And and the explanation was that there was already a, a, a force in place to repeal SB one, so they kind of wanted to nip it before it gets, you know, down down the road. And that's the reason why they asked us to, to bring it back to the Board of Supervisors. And they specifically stated that they're not in the business to bring in these things out as before. It is more of an individual county's decision, but because the magnitude of what repeal of SB1 had, both CSAC and RCRC decided to ask the prospective counties to, to vote and support on it. Yeah, Supervisor De La Cruz, you have a motion that you oh. wanted to make? Um, well, I'm still... I'm still writing down the language, and so I would allow another fellow supervisor to make a motion and see if I could ask for a, uh, an amendment to that motion. Okay. I'm, so, I'll make a motion to uh, table this until we have more time, more information comes in. But, okay. Ms. Uh, Ms. I, I got to get a second, and then we'll uh, discussion. have a discussion. I'll recognize you, uh, yeah. Mr. Espinosa. I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Mr. Espinosa. What information specifically would you like? One thing that I was thinking in our discussion, or Supervisor Medina brought up, was regards to tax and and what we're actually bringing in for the county. Would you like us to gather that information? Yes. How much money? I mean, because I want to make sure we come with <laughs> with the information you're requesting. Yes, please. Okay. And then for me, Mr. Chair, the second of the motion is. I want to see some word in that, that letter that says San Diego County is not going to take it as, as they used to take it before. But it's limited dollars here. We're going to make the effort to go see people in Sacramento and we'll, we'll individually have a responsibility to lobby Sacramento. Okay. Um, and if, if I could ask the 
make a motion do you have a idea when you would like to see this come back if this is successful on this motion well I'm looking at right now if it's not due in the June election November is uh, the election and like as Supervisor Reva stated when it becomes on the ballot that's when I want to bring it back okay just to follow protocol like we have done for I guess decades I believe so we don't need to bring this back until it qualifies for the ballot actually mr. chair I would highly recommend that we do it within the next couple months so then Sacramento Sacramento knows that there's a there's a slight deviation of our support and hopefully we can have someone come to the podium and start talking with us or gives us the, a letter to go to Sacramento and say look guys we're behind you guys however we like we like to talk to you guys about some some of the issues Okay, this is not the highest priority mm, for no. near-term future. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand. That's the way I, I'm reading it. And okay. so we have a motion and a second, being that we are uh, gather more information. If this I issue even comes before uh, get, uh, qualifies for the ballot, and then at that point in time okay. we'll determine what San Diego County's position will be. Okay. So, so it's a draft no letter? It's a draft no letter. Draft yeah. No. That's the bottom line. So, I mean, just since it's under the question, mm -hmm. should it, would it be worthwhile to draft a letter um, stating, um, you know, some concerns, how maybe we support SB1 with said concerns, and certainly um, we'd be happy to meet with, you know, maybe some stakeholders in Sacramento. It would so you would add that to the uh, so you're you're suggesting that we still send a letter to CSAC it looks like you know this whole discussion we've had here was about a letter supporting SB1 rejecting any kind of repeal effort right and so certainly you know the whatever happens with the repeal effort will it'll come to fruition through a qualified ballot initiative if it qualifies and so either you know I have no problem with ending ending the discussion today and waiting for that but certainly CSAC was requesting this, I believe, from correct. us, yeah. correct? Yeah. So sending a letter to CSAC saying, hey, affirming our support for SB1, but certainly we have some concerns and state our concerns that we're going to explore over the coming months. I think I'm going to take that as a second motion, it, or would you want to incorporate that in your motion to send a, a letter of concerns Because we've to had CSAC. so much discussion here. We've had so much discussion here. There's so, <laughs> we've expressed a lot of concern <laughs> It's just like, you know, we've, 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 we've done all this work, so we're just going to end it. We're going to walk away from it without, you know, we're talking about forming some delegation and whatnot. Should we not express our concerns to our agency we, uh, we belong to, explaining I, all those concerns? I will accept that motion or the addition with the exception that we support SB1. What we're asking is these are the flaws we have with SB1. Another type of funding. Another type of funding, but not saying we support it. Just like you said, you said it perfectly because I think it's uh, the right thing to do. They asked us to sign a letter. We can send back a letter just saying this is at this point in time, we're looking at more data, but these are the shortfalls that we have A, B, C, D, and whatever there is, maybe the whole alphabet. Okay, Mr. This Ch is Mr. Where we're Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah. We're going to be discussing this further next okay. week. Can, can we talk a little bit more about this and bring sure. back the taxes and really kind of understand what the revenue is that we would be potentially missing out, just to have a better clarity and understanding? Part of the retreat. Yes, yeah, part of the okay. retreat. Is that, is that, I think that's. Just keep it simple. At, uh, <laughs> I, think that, I think we do need to respond right. to CSAC when they, they send a letter. We should respond. I, I'm a firm believer in that, but we'll stick with the original As far motion. as the content, but, yeah, we could. We could uh, and then we could talk about the letter next week. I think we need the, to do that. Let's just wait. Let's gather more information so that way the entire board understands, you know, what SB1 means to our county. Okay. And. and Okay. Um, <coughs> Supervisor Munzer. Okay, Mr. Chair, uh, I need clarification of the motion. Is the motion to table this or is the motion to continue it to the retreat? T I, I would, I would I, ask I to would continue more, this till next I week, more, gather more information, and then at this point you, your board can do whatever. Okay, whatever but I would be more comfortable wishes. if the wording was to continue to the retreat as opposed to table it. My, my motion is to continue this conversation at our board retreat 
on February 15th, 2018. And I concur. Okay, that's the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any of those? <laughs> God, I'm a, Sorry, John, gotta thank be you. the worst chair in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you we like you. Look what time it is. Okay. Um, what have it done? Was that, was that in the form of a motion? Do you need a second on that one? <laughs> okay, uh, County Council, uh, closed session. The good news is that we're requesting that those closed sessions be taken off the agenda. We'll consider them at a future meeting. Oh, wow. Yeah. What? Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> never get out of here. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was the question? I apologize. There is no question. It looks like we do not need n number 16 at all at this time, and number 17 will consider it potentially at a future meeting. Wow, we're done? Yeah. Okay, motion to adjourn. So move. <laughs> Second, all those favor say aye. 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 Good. Aye. I'll take that back about what I said. Awesome, about Anthony. You. <laughs> you are awesome. <laughs> I know I could go, go to work. <laughs>